Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Marisa LaFleur, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce this event with Priya Fielding Singh, presenting her book, How the Other Half Eats, The Untold Story of Food and Inequality in America, in conversation with Tomas Jimenez. Again, thank you for joining us. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community far and wide. Every week we'll be hosting events here on our Zoom account. And as always, you can view our full event schedule on our website at harvard.com slash events. And while you're there, you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our bookshelves. This event will have closed captioning available. Uh, depending on the version of Zoom that you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on the bottom of your screen. Also, this evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. So if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many questions as time allows. Finally, in the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase tonight's featured book, How the Other Half Eats, on harvard.com, as well as a link to, to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you for showing up and tuning in. In support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly, but we thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. And now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Priya Fielding Singh is a sociologist and assistant professor in the Department of Family and Consumer Studies at the University of Utah. She earned her PhD in sociology from Stanford University and completed her postdoctoral training as a National Institute of Health Fellow in Cardiovascular Disease Prevention at the Stanford School of Medicine. Her work is at the intersection of sociology and med medicine. Um, she is an expert on gender, family, and health disparities in the contemporary United States. Her new book, How the Other Half Eats, follows four American families and examines how inequality manifests in the food we eat. In a starred review, Publishers Weekly calls it a devastating portrait, adding that Feeling Singh's deeply empathetic approach allows her to personalize the copious data on nutritional and health disparities she cites. And the San Francisco Chronicle writes that How the Other Half he Eats weaves lyrical storytelling and fascinating research into a compelling narrative that shows the devastating impact, physical, emotional, and economic, our industrial food system has not just on the other half, but upon us all. She'll be joined in conversation tonight by Tomas Jimenez, Professor of Sociology and Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and the Robert and Ruth Halpern University Fellow in Undergraduate Education at Stanford University. He is also director of the undergraduate program on urban studies and the author of several books on immigration, assimilation, social mobility, and ethnic and racial identity. We're so happy to have them both here with us tonight. Without further ado, I will turn the digital podium over to Priya and Tomas. Wonderful. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, Priya, it is such a joy to be here in this uh, in this meeting with you, virtual as it may be, to, to talk about your fabulous book. And, and we're going to have a chance to talk quite a bit about the book in the next 40 minutes or so. Um, but before we get into it, I just want to remind people who are joining us that, that you will have the opportunity to ask some questions of Priya. And you can do so by dropping your questions in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and at about 20 minutes before we end, I'll turn over. I'll, I'll turn to some of those questions and and pose them to Priya. So uh, as we go along, please be thinking of questions and and feel free to drop them in in the Zoom room. Priya, how are you doing tonight? Yeah, great. I'm really excited to have the chance to talk to you about uh, the book and to be able to share my research with everyone. Well, let, let's get right into it. Um, so we, there's a lot of discussion about inequality in the United States today and, and the ways in, in which it manifests. I mean, we hear a lot about um, income inequality, about wealth inequality. We hear about disparities in the kind of neighborhoods that, that people live in. And, and here you're talking about nutrition. Tell us, th this is a bit of an unusual angle, although I, you know, I, I think in reading your book, it becomes clear that it's, it's a really important dimension uh, of, of inequality, but take us uh, inside your thinking about what motivated you to write this book. Yeah, so, well, the, the backstory that everyone should know is that 
when I had this idea that I wanted to study food and nutrition and inequality, um, you know, at the time I was a sociology PhD student at Stanford and Tomas was actually a professor in my department. And I showed up at Tomas's office one day and told him that this is what I wanted to study and that I wanted him to, to be a mentor to me on the project. And, and um, he had a little bit of skepticism about this as a, an area of interest, but the more that we talked and the more that we really dug into what is so unique and important and resonant about food and inequality, um, he decided to, to take a chance on a PhD student um, at the time and, and actually helped shepherd me through through this project and this book. So it's, a, it's also especially exciting to be able to, to be in conversation with you, Tomas, given that you know the a lot of what went into this work. Um, you know, I have been interested in issues of inequality since I was a kid, um, kind of since I can remember. And a lot of that started when I was nine years old and my family decided to become a foster family. And so for all of my middle and high school years, we took in foster children. And I remember being really struck even at a young age um, by the fact that even though I was sharing a home with my foster siblings, sharing meals, sharing clothes, um, we had come from such different places and I knew that we were on actually such different trajectories, even though we were sharing so much in that moment. And I became really interested in what the forces were that were setting me and my foster siblings on such different paths. And so that interest in inequality is what drove me to graduate school. It's what drove me to the discipline of sociology. And when I got to my PhD program, I became really interested in what I see as a really intimate form of inequality, like something that every single one of us does every single day of our lives, multiple times a day from the moment we're born to the moment that we die, and that is put food in our bodies. Um, and I felt like there was a lot of discussion about food and inequality happening in the broader public discourse and also happening within the fields of public health and medicine. But I didn't see the kind of conversations about food and inequality that brought a really sociological lens to it that looked at not just, you know, geography and access, but also the symbolic meaning that foods ha food has, the emotions that go into feeding and eating. And so I knew that that was something that I wanted to approach from a social scientific angle and bring a different set of questions and methods to, to bear on the issue. Yeah, I mean, Priya, I can I, I can remember the skepticism well. Uh, you know, I'm 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 somebody who writes about immigration uh, and race and ethnicity, and and so when you came to me and said that you wanted to do a project on how parents make decisions about what their kids eat, um, I I was kind of at a loss to at least I thought I was at a loss to guide you, uh, and I was skeptical about whether whether uh, you could make this project fly, but I, I think. You know, you very quickly turned me into a believer, and uh, you know the proof is in the pudding. Here, you have this fabulous book now that that uh, is your dissertation, and and I want to get a bit more into the findings uh, now. And so, um, you know, when I think about, or I think when many people think about food and inequality, the first thing that comes to mind because it's it's in the popular discourse is food deserts, right? The 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 big issue with especially. Uh, folks who um, who are in economically precarious situations is that they can't find the right food to feed their kids because they live in neighborhoods that are just bereft of of uh, of any kind of grocery store or or and especially access to to nutritional food. So it's all about food deserts. It's all about access. But that's not the story you tell. Can you can you um, talk us through that a little bit? Why is this not all about food deserts? Yeah, so it's interesting because I think actually in the fields of public health and medicine and people who really study nutritional inequality and diet disparities, there has been this realization over the past five, six years that we actually can't hang our hats on the food desert argument. And this food desert argument is one that really, you know, starting in about 2010 with the launch of Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign to end childhood obesity that argument really became the prevailing 
narrative about what is causing nutritional inequality. And it's interesting because it actually wasn't really founded on much research. It was founded on this idea that got popularized that um, childhood obesity, especially among low-income kids of color, stemmed in large part from the fact that those families had limited access to fresh fruits and vegetables and that they lived in neighborhoods where there weren't grocery stores or supermarkets. And so what followed kind of amazingly were just these heroic policy efforts at the national, state, and local levels to bring supermarkets into food deserts and with the hope that doing so would improve kids' nutrition, obesity rates would fall, like we would solve the issue. And I'm really sympathetic to this food desert argument because what I like about it is that it puts the focus on structures and neighborhoods and environments, and it kind of takes the, the onus off of families. Like it really moves away from a narrative of blaming the victim. But the problem is that what we've learned over the last five, six years is that the food desert argument actually hinges on a few assumptions that are that have like a face validity to them, but they actually are not borne out at all by the data. So one really simple one that I think tells us a lot about why this argument falls short is, you know, there's this assumption that people who live in food deserts have to shop at convenience stores and um, gas stations. Like they don't shop at supermarkets. So they are shopping at these really small places where there aren't fresh vegetables or fruit. But it turns out what we know from wide scale supermarket data is that 90% of grocery dollars are spent at supermarkets and that low income individuals, even low income individuals living in food deserts are just as likely as anyone else to shop at a supermarket and are actually quite willing to drive for supermarkets. If you look at the percent of folks who live in a food desert in the United States, it's 13%. But then if you take into account, if you kind of filter out everyone who has access to a privately owned vehicle, that number drops to just 3%. So we're not gonna be able to really explain these widespread diet disparities with something that actually only accounts for 3% of the entire population. And so, you know, the food desert argument really had a lot of promise but it's fallen short. And in my work, I try to show what else is going on. Um, you know, research suggests that just about 10% of the dietary gap can be attributed to food access. So in my work, I try to say, okay, well, if it's not food access, then what else could be playing into these really different diets? Yeah, let me, let me ask you to, to answer your own question. If, if it's not food deserts, what's going on? What, what else can explain these dis well, actually, first, you know, let, let, let's actually back back up for a second. So, um, you know, I think the book is is based on a premise that that there are disparities in in health and and disparities in nutrition by by class origin. Can you just talk us through what those disparities look like? Yeah, absolutely. So, right. So, we have these really widespread nutritional disparities. Um, you know, interestingly, over the past 20 years, overall American diet quality has slightly improved. It's still, it's actually important to, to note that when we talk about the American diet, like there is room for improvement across the board. Like there might be this perception that high income folks are eating extremely healthy and low income folks are eating extremely poorly. It's actually not that at all everyone has some room for improvement in their diet. But what we've seen is that these there have been gains over time, but they've been largely concentrated among high income people and among white people. And so there's really, there's a socioeconomic gradient and there's a racial pattern where higher income folks are eating better than um, lower income individuals and white people are eating a higher quality diet than black and Mexican American individuals. And what we see with this gap is that contrary to what we might have hoped with all of the work that was put into alleviating food deserts, that gap is extremely durable. And there are also signs that, that it's in fact growing. 
So with, with that as, as kind of deep background, it's not food deserts. The disparities are there, they're real, they're durable. Um, so let me ask you to answer the question that you, you sort of posed, I think somewhat rhetorically a second ago, but, but what else is going on? What did you find in your research that, that might help explain the gap? And you know, bearing in mind that everyone out there is gonna go buy your book, so we don't wanna give away everything, but, but you know, give us, uh, pun intended here, give us a taste of, of what you found. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, I think, I think one thing that became really clear to me um, you know, when I was doing interviews with all these families, spending time with families in a really like deep long term way. One thing that struck me, first of all, was that, you know, the mothers that I met and I focus a lot in this book on parents and mothers in particular, because in the US, uh, mothers really remain still the parent who's primarily in charge of, of feeding children. But these moms told me all kinds of challenges related to how they were feeding their kids. But very rarely, if ever, did geographic access come up as a barrier that they faced. What came up more often was financial barriers. And this makes a lot of sense. Like we have a lot of research showing that a healthy diet is um, can be out of reach for a number of uh, individuals and that healthy food on a calorie basis is more expensive than unhealthy food. But something else that came up in my interviews that really struck me was how many low-income mothers told me that they actually ended up spending more on food than they would have in order to meet their kids' requests. So they said, you know, I could cook some rice and beans, but my kid really wants Pizza Hut and I want to get it for him. And so, you know, this narrative that kept coming up in these interviews cued me into something that was like, it's actually not just about financial access in the way that we've thought about it. Like maybe there's something else going on with finances, with access that we need to dig into more deeply. And what I found on the broadest level is that the experience of raising one's children in poverty or affluence fundamentally shapes the meaning that food takes on to parents and the way that they think about, feel about, and use food with their children. And those differences actually hold real important implications for broader diet disparities that we see across society. So maybe just what you you uh, you made reference to to how you did this work, and um, you know I I I know because uh, because I talked to you about it uh, on a weekly basis as you were doing it, but you know I think one of the things that you bring to this conversation, not this one right now, but the broader conversation about inequality and and health is a a real firsthand view of how parents are making decisions about what to feed their kids, how they're planning for meals, how they grocery shop. It is not, you know, the kind of view out of the window of an airplane where we, where we kind of see the broad landscape, although, you know, the, the project is informed by that broad landscape, but you really go into the lives of the people who are making these decisions, mothers in particular. Can you, can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I feel like we have really great research that shows the breadth of the problem. Like we have nationally representative surveys that look at differences in diet quality. We have, we have done a great job at understanding the scope, but we've done a pretty poor job at digging into why. And, you know, when I was thinking about how to design this study, some people told me that I should do a survey. And I thought about that because they're like, you can reach more people. You'll be able to, to, um, kind of quantify the differences. And I thought about like what kind of survey question I would design. And really the thing that I was interested in is, Lynn, is how do you make choices for your family? How do you choose the food for your kids? And I thought about the survey question. It would be, you know, how do you choose food for your kids? And then maybe it'd be a multiple choice. And it'd be like how healthy the food is, how convenient the food is, how cheap the food is. And I thought about analyzing that data. And I thought, what would that actually tell me about those choices. Like those choices would be kind of devoid of the context within which they're made. It's not really like 
there's one kind of thing that reigns supreme in our decisions about food, all of us know that our food choices are really complex and actually reflect a range of shifting priorities. They can be really dynamic. They can change from one, mo from one moment to the next. So I saw it as kind of essential to go talk to people about those choices to put into a greater context how they were making these difficult decisions, how they were dealing with these challenging trade-offs and how the environments they were living in were shaping those. And so I decided to do all of these interviews with parents and kids. I did about 160 interviews. And when I was done with that, I felt like I had so much rich narrative data, so, so much deeper of an understanding of the choices that families were making. But then I wanted to see how do those how did what families told me square with their behaviors? And that's when I knew that I wanted to observe families and again, do that within the context that they were living in. So spend time with them in their homes, go to school with them, go to church with them, go to birthday parties and quinceañeras and really see, you know, how food played out in those different contexts and the meaning that food took onto them, given those different environments they were living in. Yeah, and one of the things that, that I appreciate about um, not just the method in general, but, but the way that you selected the people you interviewed and the families that you chose to spend time with. And I think it's important that, you know, you mentioned a, a few of the things that you did with them. You went grocery shopping with them. You went out to dinner with them. You helped them prepare food in their kitchen. So you really, really um, not just established a relationship and some rapport, but really, really saw kind of multiple dimensions of how they, they make this choice. Um, but one of the things that I appreciate about how you selected these families is that you, you got a group of families from across the kind of socioeconomic spectrum. And yeah. so sometimes and when we, as scholars, are, are interested in inequality, with good reason, we focus on the most vulnerable populations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's because um, those are the people who, who we think we should be paying attention to. And and trying to, to, to create a more equal society. Um, but you got a really broad understanding of how parents are making choices by looking at families from across the, the socioeconomic spectrum. Can you say a little bit about what that looked like? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, I mean, you're totally right. Like the focus is often on, to be honest, families living under the poverty line. And I knew that I wanted to, because I was interested in inequality, I wanted to see how that inequality played out across the whole spectrum. So I wanted the analytical leverage of seeing how do these choices that families are making vary by the resources that families have. And so, you know, all of the families that I interviewed were from across the socioeconomic spectrum. So from families living in their cars and RVs to families living in multi-million dollar homes. Um, and when I chose the families that I wanted to observe, I was similarly attuned to this um, priority of making sure that I had really important variations. So, so I follow, I profile for families in the book. You know, one is um, a mom, Naya, who is a black single mother, she is she is living well below the poverty line. She's really living hand to mouth, um, largely reliant on government assistance to be able to keep a roof over her head and, and put food in her kids' stomachs. Um, Dana is right kind of financially above that. She is a white single mom, really, you know, someone we would think of as like the working poor, like she was above the poverty line, which meant she didn't qualify for a lot of benefits, but she was barely making ends meet. She put half of her income to rent every month. Um, right above her, Renata, a Latina mom of two, who um, was really solidly in the middle class. Um, she worked at a bank. Um, she owned a home with her husband, but she told me, as many folks in the middle class today feel, that she was still kind of living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and then on the far end of the spectrum, Julie, a uh, white, uh, very affluent, uh, stay-at-home mother of two who, you know, lived in a house that she, a, a million-plus dollar house that she owned with her husband, had just kind of all the resources in the world. And so for me, as a researcher being able to spend time with families in such extremely different circumstances helped me understand 
why I was seeing those differences, what was playing out differently for those mothers. And I think actually gave me a lot of leverage that I wouldn't have had if I had just focused on like one part of the socioeconomic spectrum. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll note one thing and, and, and that, that maybe you didn't mention and then jump off uh, on another question. Which is this, this, no, that's okay. This, this all happened in the San Francisco Bay Area. Oh, that's key. Right? Yeah, and, and that's which, key. Is, which is really, which is key in, in a couple of respects, right? I mean, and maybe you can talk about this a little bit, but um, you know, this is a place of, uh, of enormous affluence and wealth, which also means that people who don't kind of operate in that strata of the socioeconomic distribution really struggle. It's a, it's a, yep. it's a difficult place to live if you don't make a ton of money. And so, you know, it, it, talk a little bit about, you know, this, this the, the, the kind of context in which you studied it broader, the broader context of Silicon Valley. And then, um, and then, you know, maybe how we should think about what you observed here playing out in other places. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, the Bay area was, you know, you could argue it's kind of a unique context, but I actually think about the Bay Area more as a trendsetter than an outlier in this age of inequality that we're living in in this country. You know, the Bay Area is known for inequality, but a lot of the trends that have exacerbated that inequality are happening in cities across the U.S., whether it's increasing residential segregation, a hollowing of the middle class, like increasing hardship, financial hardship among the poor. These are all things that we've seen, you know, growing in other places. And so while the families in the book live in the Bay Area, you know, I propose in the book that they actually tell an increasingly American story. Um, and I think that a lot of the, the processes and experiences that I uncovered in my work of course, there are some specifics to the Bay Area. The Bay Area is, you know, to a large degree, an urban or suburban context. It's not an overly rural area. You know, we know that geography impacts food food choices, but um, I think a lot of them are pretty generalizable. Like I have, I have a lot of confidence that some of the things that I uncovered in my work, if we went to Detroit or Atlanta or Portland, Maine, that we would see similar things. They might vary a bit. There might be peculiarities and geographic spe specificities. But I think that, you know, the dynamics that I saw within families, the choices that I saw made around different financial resources, I have confidence that, that a lot of that would actually hold up. Yeah, I do too. I do too. And I want to um, just dive a little bit into, into one of the concepts that you reveal on the book here. And, and I noticed... And, and I'm sure the folks who were joining us noticed a second ago when you talked about the different families that you spent time with, the four families, you mentioned the mother every mm -hmm. time, right? And in a couple of cases, single moms, and in a couple of cases, not. But, um, and that's actually core to the book. And so in the book, you write a lot about the idea of the quote unquote good mom and, and how that shapes how mothers feed their kids. Um, and then you mentioned this term intensive mothering as well to explain the, the kind of um, gendered standards for, for mothers. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I knew when I started this project that I wanted to focus on families and parents, but I didn't realize that this was actually going to largely be a project about contemporary motherhood and the demands of and the stakes of mothering in a society that has so much inequality and so little support for mothers to do a lot of the tasks that they are not only expected to do, but also judged and evaluated for. And so I talk about this, I use a very sociological term of intensive mothering, which really refers to these widely held and deeply ingrained beliefs that we have in this country about what makes women good mothers. And we actually have a lot of consensus about what makes women good mothers. But the problem is that what we think makes women good mothers is really unrealistic and largely unattainable for most moms across society. So we expect that moms will be their kids' primary caregivers in all aspects. We expect them to be child-centered in their parenting, to devote extensive resources to their kids at every turn, 
to sacrifice their own well-being and their own needs for their children. And this is what we define as a good mom. Now, if we think about these standards, and then we think about something like feeding, that is really, to my mind, one of the core, most gendered, quintessential mothering tasks. Like, it is both biologically core to being a mother, and it's also societally core because as a society, we expect that moms are in charge of, and we see moms as kind of innately positioned to feed and nourish their children. And so in the book, I talk about how these expectations and these demands and the fact that mothers are often put on trial for what their kids eat and what their kids' bodies end up looking like, how that fundamentally shapes how they use food. And all the moms in my study were using food to show to themselves, to their children, to society at large, that they were good moms. But the resources that they had at their disposal actually profoundly shaped the way that they use food to prove that. Yeah, this is this is so core to the study and and you know one of the the really kind of keynote findings. Um, and Priya, you know this, but uh, and I'm sure folks who are listening are, are doing just what I did in every meeting we had as we as you developed this project, <clears throat> which is thinking about how these these issues play out in our own lives. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Priya, Priya could probably bill me for several hours of therapy. I have two children for all the Still's time coming. she would she. <laughs> <laughs> hold off let me get them through college first um <laughs> for all the times that you would come to my office and report some really new exciting findings I say oh I can totally relate and you know I see this happening in my own children's lives in our own house and and even in our our own friend circle and and mm -hmm. so uh you know as you pointed out at the at, at the opening um this is something we all do and so I you know I think I want to emphasize that there is a anyone who reads this book will relate to it either because they have been uh, the child of a parent or they themselves are a parent. So it really is something, it really is about all of us. Um, and, and the other thing I just want to say too, as a, as a plug for the book, is that, you know, this came out of an academic study, but, but the writing style and the narrative uh, really has all the best features of, of kind of academic insight, but also a, a kind of uh, a, a journalistic style in, in terms of the story you tell, but built on, on kind of solid social science. So, so it's got the best of all worlds. Um, let me just remind folks that, that you can weigh in here too in the conversation by posing questions in the Q&A box. I see we have a few questions that have trickled in and we'll get to those uh, in just a moment. Um, but for, before we do that, um, Priya, I, I want to return to the kind of, um, you know, food desert as the, as the kind of preeminent structural explanation for nutrition and inequality um, as, uh, uh, and versus the, the more kind of agentic agency story that you're telling, or one might say you're telling. And, mm -hmm. you know, sociologists of inequality talk about the, the difference between structure and agency, you know, is it our circumstances that kind of bear down on us uh, and that's the kind of structural account or the structural question. And then the, the question about agency is, how much power do we have to, to kind of shape our own destiny given, given the circumstances we find ourselves in? Some might, you know, have a superficial reading of your book, I would argue, and say, you're blaming the victim. Mm -hmm. That this is the, you know, you're telling us not about food uh, deserts, that it's not about structure, but it's really about the choices that parents are making uh, mm -hmm. about, about how they feed their food. So how, how, excuse, how would they feed their children? Excuse me. How would you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I think with something like food, there really is this tendency to blame the victim because of how much, in many ways, choice we do have. Like something that we, you know, the stuff we put in our bodies is really one of the few things in our lives that most of us have some degree of choice around. It's something that we personally do. It's not necessarily done unto us. But in the book, what I'm trying to show is how these broader inequalities, how these broader structures, how things like unlivable wages and unaffordable housing and you know inability to access healthcare, how all of these broader things that are circulating around impact what food means to us in ways that impact our choices. And so I think that uh, you know in, in the book I, I talk about whether or not, um, 
someone should read my findings as blaming the victim. You know, I, I talk about um, Naya, who I saw take her daughter um, to Starbucks uh, when she was barely able to make the rent that month, when her cell phone had been shut off the day before because she couldn't pay the bill. And I saw her treat her and her daughter to $11 of Starbucks. And I looked at that moment and I thought, how am I going to present this in a way that makes Naya's choice seem rational versus, you know, like she's squandering her money. But the thing is that the longer that I spent with Naya, I came to understand that that choice was completely rational. And while it's something that's easy to judge from the outside, what I try to do in the book is to show how the incredible financial scarcity and instability that Naya lives with makes doing something like spending $11 on a Starbucks make complete sense. Because for Naya, with you know how close to the bone she was living, she never knew if she would have money the next day. Like money today never meant money tomorrow. And so when Naya had money, she would spend it on her kids the ways that she could because of this innate visceral desire that every parent has to be able to provide for their kid. And if Naya didn't spend that money today, she might not have anything to give her kids for weeks. And that, you know, especially according to our ideas of what makes women good mothers, that was completely unacceptable. So I'm trying in the book to take these choices that are so easy to evaluate and call frivolous or negligent or careless parenting and to show how the broader context of financial deprivation can actually lead a choice like that to be fully rational. And honestly, as a parent could lead anyone to act in that way because of how core to a parental sense of self it is to be able to provide for kids. Absolutely. That's such an important lesson that, that I know you learned from doing the research and that you teach us in the book. Um, at this stage, I want to turn it over to some questions that we okay. have yeah. from our audience, and, and we have quite a few, and, and uh, I'm going to take the liberty of reading them. Uh, and some of these have come in anonymously. However, our first one comes from uh, Carolyn Lopez. And Carolyn asks, uh, in addition to financial issues, <clears throat> In what ways did you see culture or race slash ethnicity uh, influence families' choices around food? Yeah, race, ethnicity, and, and culture were hugely influential on families' food choices. You know, you look at any family that I spent time with and where that family had grown up, where, you know, one's parents had come from the culture that they had grown up in, the country from which they had emigrated, all of that was really core to how each family ate. And that, you know, for all of the mothers that I interviewed, you know, each of them had something that they were trying to pass on to their child through food, whether it was trying to transmit the recipes that they had grown up with themselves, whether it was trying to preserve a ethnic or cultural identity with their children through food, you know, that was extremely important and really shaped um, the priorities that mothers had. But what I found, you know, especially among um, mothers who were themselves immigrants was that they were really caught in this bind where on the one hand, they wanted their kids to eat the foods that they had grown up with. I'm thinking of one mother uh, Teresa, who had grown up in Sinaloa, Mexico, and one, her favorite thing was to provide, was to cook those dishes of her youth for her son. At the same time, you know, Teresa had come to the United States, had worked extremely hard, and she wanted her son to fit in. She wanted her son to assimilate whatever that means to not be bullied in school for having preferences that were seen as deviant or weird. And so she really saw, you know, an Americanization of her kid's diet as important. And I think sometimes that's not actually how it's framed it more broadly. It's like kind of like those mothers are losing because their kids' diets are becoming Americanized. But that's not how she and a lot of mothers saw it. They actually saw really this kind of push and pull of like, wanting their kids to eat certain dishes from where they'd come from, but 
but also, you know, succeed in this new country that they had landed in that they were raising their children in. And so I think that that's something that all mothers struggle with in some way, but I, that was really um, particularly acute for mothers who hadn't grown up in the U.S. Great, thank you. We, we have several questions about policy and anyone who has hung out with sociologists knows that we're really good at diagnosing problems and not so good, <laughs> although we're getting better as a discipline. We're trying, at, we're trying. We're trying at, at proposing solutions, but I, I know you do have some ideas about what we can do. Uh, and so a lot of these questions, there's, there's three or four of them are yep. about policy. And yep. so, you know, what would you want policymakers to know about uh, about how to enact some change, given what you found? Yeah. So when I think about how we're actually going to move the needle on nutritional inequality, I think about kind of two approaches that we should be working on in tandem. So the first is really related to ensuring that all families have a minimum standard of living that allows them to provide their children, not just with the basic kind of bare bones needs, but the ability to provide their children with a little bit extra. And I think, you know, if we look at, if I think about the mothers in my study who were living below the poverty line, of which there were many, um, they were uh, in a standard of living that to my mind in this country with the amount of wealth that we have is completely unacceptable and a moral failing. And so I think about things related to the safety net, related to family policies that would help elevate families out of poverty and ensure that for mothers, a bag of Cheetos isn't the only thing that they can give their kids that will show to them on a daily basis that they love and they care for them. Like if that's how, if that's what a bag of Cheetos means, then we're not doing right by those families, you know? So I think about, policies that work to elevate families out of poverty. But I also think stuff like that really needs to be paired with policies that try to change and improve the food system. Particularly, you know, in the book, I write a lot about the role of big food and how none of the families that I met escaped the reach and the power of big food. And you know, in this country, uh, we don't have very much regulation of marketing. And to be honest with all of you, I don't have a ton of faith that that's something that we have the political will to do right now. But every so often, we actually get the political will to protect children. And I think that trying to ban in many cases and regulate marketing to children is something that I would like to see more of. I don't think we'll ever get to the place where we really are fully protecting kids. But one thing we can do is also stop the targeted marketing of low income and racial ethnic minority children with especially unhealthy food. And we can also work to, you know, a lot of the solutions I think about are actually starting with kids and trying to shape kids' palates and nourish children and, you know, starting in schools, making sure that there's no marketing in schools, making sure that school meals meet certain nutrition standards so that two meals a day, at least we know kids are getting that provide some nutrients. And more than that, you know, to the degree that we can create food environments within institutions like schools that help shape kids' palates for healthier food, kids might actually go and bring those preferences back into their families. Kids actually wield a lot of power within families around what's eaten. And so I think if we, you know, brainstorm ways that we can work with children, they can actually have a really tremendous impact on family diet. And as I show in my book, particularly low income families diets. Great, thank you. Um, I, I'm actually gonna take this question from um, Ann Donahue who has a, has a very specific question. Um, and, and Ann asks, does the federal food stamp program or SNAP uh, mm -hmm. shape families' food choices? Yep. Yeah, I mean, most of the um, low income families that I met were reliant on SNAP to, to feed themselves and their children, um, not uh, undocumented families, they do not have access to SNAP. So there were a number of undocumented mothers that I interviewed who did not have access to those benefits. So they were really on their own. Um, and I would say that SNAP was pretty essential 
in ensuring that these families had enough to eat. But SNAP, you know, it's in the name supplemental, you know, that's what the S is for. It's intended to supplement, but I found that most families were pretty much completely relying on it. Um, it wasn't like an addition to their income. It was really their food budget for the month. Um, and what we know on a national level is that 80% of SNAP dollars are spent within the first two weeks of the month. So that the second two weeks of the month, that's when we see, you know, we have really high rates of food insecurity in this country compared to other countries that are similarly um, wealthy. And um, we see that those food insecurity experiences really surge in the latter half of the month. So um, I've been, you know, kind of on the, the topic of optimism or change, I've been very excited by the fact that um, SNAP benefits have now just recently increased 27%. You know, that's the largest um, increase in history, actually, and will help with, um, you know, ensuring that families have food throughout the month. But, you know, when we think about things like inflation and surging food prices, that kind of increase, which is about 36 extra dollars a month, is actually not really going to go far enough. And so, it's a step in the right direction, but but I think that you know federal food assistance programs like SNAP are truly one of the best um, tools we have at our disposal to help with hunger and and in many ways with nutrition. And I think they're a bit underutilized, and they have the potential to um, do a lot more across the board. Yeah, thank you, Priya. You know, um, at the beginning of the pandemic. I guess maybe not the very beginning, but but we were well into it. Um, you know, I, I was, and I'm just getting personal a little bit here. I was struck by the fact that when I opened up my my own refrigerator, it was full, and I had a roof over my head. And thank God, no one in in my household got sick. And it and it you know speaks to all of the the kinds of advantages that that I think people like me have in in you know pandemic or not. Um, but it also made me think about the people who, you know, were becoming tremendously food insecure. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we really had no access to food. We're lining up, you know, food banks were overwhelmed. Um, there was, there was a, a, a shortage. People couldn't feed their, their children. They couldn't feed themselves. Um, and food insecurity hasn't gone away. And, and there's certainly some programs that help alleviate that. Um, but, you know, in, in these times, there are also indicators of some hope. We find hope in desperate times. We find people who are doing everything they can to, um, to, to kind of rebuild the community and, and to kind of help each other make it through. And, and so I want to, in that spirit, I, I want to read this next question mm -hmm. from, uh, this is an anonymous attendee, but, but they said that something, I'm, I'm just going to read verbatim here. Something mm -hmm. I found really heartening is the ongoing pandemic and the ongoing and ongoing pandemic crisis is the spread of community refrigerators and other community-led initiatives to get people the things they need. And um, this um, attendee wants to know what can mutual, what role can mutual aid play in addressing food inequality? Yeah, I think it can play a really tremendous role. Um, you know, I think for me, when I think about like how are we going to enact the most change at the highest level in the most efficient way, I often, my mind just goes to policy. I'm like, how can we increase SNAP dollars? How can we expand childcare assistance? Like what laws can we pass? And um, you know, something that I actually find with the students that I teach and mentor is that they're often thinking about these kinds of initiatives, like on the ground, how do we um, as communities um, leverage social ties, um, leverage, you know, informal networks to, to address issues around food inequality. And I think that is super inspiring and speaks to the uh, collective compassion and support that we can leverage during these times of crisis. But when I think about the scale of the problem, my mind still goes back to like, what are we going to do on federal and state policy levels? And, and I think that, you know, in this country, we have come to believe that food banks and you know what we think what we call food charity is you know the way that we're addressing hunger but food banks and honestly you know 
community fridges, unfortunately, are just never going to solve the problem. Like that is the kind of thing that on a really large scale has to be dealt with um, through like sweeping government action. Um, and so I am so inspired by this work, but sometimes I worry that we let we let government off the hook when we when we um, like have this narrative of <clears throat> food banks and food charity and um, a lot of amazing work being done at the grassroots level that that is going to to work our way out of this. Priya, let, let's let's get a little bit personal here, and this is a question that came from uh, that actually I had and, and that and that one of our attendees asked, but. Um, you know, I know in the process of doing this research, you became a parent, and, yeah. and you write a little bit about this in, in the beginning of the book, um, but how has what you learned in, in the process of doing the research for and writing this book um, informed how you approach providing food for, for your child? Yeah, I mean, it's it's played a really tremendous role. So I conducted the research for this book before I became a parent, and I think I think it actually speaks to just how um, fundamental feeding is to motherhood and all the things that I talked about that even as someone who wasn't a parent, it was so abundantly clear to me that this was an extremely emotional and symbolic thing for, for mothers and within families. So, so I, I kind of knew the findings of my research before and then and then, you know, about a week before I gave birth to my daughter, I signed this uh, this book deal, uh, which was kind of yeah qu questionable choices as far as timing. But you know, I came back after after having some parental leave, and I sat down to write this book. And um, you know, I was in the process of trying to nurse my daughter, and I felt for the first time a visceral understanding of what so many of the mothers and caregivers in the book had told me. And I, it was stuff that I knew, but I felt it on a really emotional level. I felt how responsible I was for my daughter, how, you know, my love for her was actually so intimately tied to um, the accountability that I felt for her body and her well being. And so, you know, I think that that impacted me in two ways. One, I think it actually, you know, infused some emotion into the book in a way that that might not have been there if I hadn't gone through that experience myself. And at the same time, you know, I think that sometimes when people know that I write about these topics, they think that I must be um, very obsessed with my daughter's diet and, um, you know, that I, I must have really high standards for it. And of course, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a product of my class position and my racial ethnic background, all those things shape the, the ways that I care about and think about food for my daughter. But I also feel so frustrated and angry about the amount of pressure that is put on me as a mother to deliver for my daughter that I think the biggest thing that I have learned from my own research is to give myself a lot of grace and to appreciate all the work that I do do. And that's something that, um, you know, I've had uh, a few friends who are mothers read, read the book. A lot of mothers read advanced copies and they said that that was actually something that, that they took away for themselves was just a new appreciation of how much they're doing and how hard those choices are, even when you have the most resources, but then to think about the fact that a lot of folks don't have those resources. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I I really appreciate that. And and you know, for for anyone who does research, um, you know, there there is a there is a kind of clinical mindset that you have when you mm -hmm. when you kind of gather the data and write about it. But um, but even you know, social scientists are human beings too, and we that inhabit we inhabit the very worlds that we write about, and and it's hard not to. Uh, and in fact, I think good research forces us to empathize. Uh, as researchers, but also um, invites our readers to empath empathize with the people who we write about. And, and you do just a beautiful job of that in the book. We have just a few more minutes. Um, I, I do want to remind folks that, um, that you can add a question in the last four minutes if you want. Um, and I, I'll do my best to get to them. And I might just read all the questions at once. And then, and then Priya can kind of 
uh, uh, pick and choose what she wants. But I do also want to remind folks that you can purchase the book uh, at the Harvard Bookstore. The Harvard Bookstore is hosting this fabulous event and the book is How the Other Half Eats, The Untold Story of Food and Inequality in America. And we're, we're talking with the author Priya Fielding Singh. Um, so Priya, we have just a couple of more questions. I'm, I'm just going to read both of them and, and then ask you to, to kind of take them in turn or, or in whatever order you like, okay? So the first question is, where do you plan to go next with, uh, with your research? Are there issues or questions that came out of this project uh, that you plan to dig uh, more into in your, in your future research? And then the second question is, what sort of experience could help policymakers build similar level empathy as you do in your book for the experiences of lower SES families? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, these are great questions. Given we have two minutes left, I'll do a, a, a quick address of the, the latter one. I mean, I think that um, there are really big issues of representation in who is making choices about policies that affect low income families. And it's really important that people who have those lived experiences also have a seat at the table when these discussions are happening, because you don't know what it's like to live through experiences of hunger or food insecurity. Um, if you, you know, haven't been through that, and so you shouldn't necessarily be making those decisions without the input of folks who have, who have endured it and survived that. Um, as far as my own research, I have approximately a million questions uh, that spawned from the work that I did and, and from this book. But, you know, on the topic of the pandemic, I have become really interested in um, widening disparities that we've seen. So um, from, you know, the beginning of the pandemic to now, we've actually seen really interestingly um, no rise in overall hunger rates in this country, um, which is in, in large part due to the dispersal of so much federal aid. But we've seen some really troubling inequities widen. So during the pandemic, uh, food insecurity went down in white households, but it actually went up in Black and Latinx households, as well as households with children. And so I'm really interested in what is driving those disparities? Where is the federal relief and the aid um, falling short? Like why is it maybe reaching some families and not others? And what are we gonna do to try to close those gaps in hunger? So that's some of the work that I'm looking forward to doing moving forward. Great, thank you, Priya. Um, we are about at time. Um, I'm going to turn things over to our friends at the Harvard Bookstore to, to close us out. But before I do that, I want to, on behalf of everyone who is joining us today and really anyone who is going to read this book and everyone should, should go out and buy this book and read it, uh, thank you for, um, for the research that you did, for sharing with us what you learned from doing that research and for being such an important voice on one of the most pressing issues of our time. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was such a pleasure to get to chat with you. And thank you everyone for, for coming and um, giving me an opportunity to share a little bit about the work that I did. Thank you so much to both of you for being here and for that very interesting conversation. Thank you to everyone in the audience who joined us this evening. Again, um, you can learn more about this book and purchase it at the link that I've put in the chat. Um, but otherwise, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, uh, thank you again for joining us. Have a good night. Keep reading and be well. Thank you.